Okay, let's get started. I was reading um, something online the other day. Someone had sent it to me, and there was an article about how this guy, James Randi, who is very critical of people who think in irrational ways, people who make claims about UFOs or the paranormal. And one of the things he just did, something that bugs him, uh, he noticed that there is a stereo company that sells these cables, these speaker cables, that are about $7,200. And he was really annoyed by this. And so he, he decided, he, he said, this is, they're just, they're stealing your money. And he offered a million dollars to anyone who could prove that these $7,000 cables are, sound better than $100 cables uh, by Monster Cable. And what I thought was really interesting, there's this magazine called Stereophile, and in Stereophile magazine, it's, it's a ridiculous magazine. I don't know why I subscribe to it, but uh, in it, they, they have articles on these, you know, stereo speakers that are, you know, $80,000 for the set, or a, you know, a CD player that is $40,000. But one of the things that is this battle that goes on, and I enjoy reading about it, is people write in and they're like, look, when you're doing these comparisons of different equipment, you've got to use good scientific method. You've got to use double blind setups to describe them, not know what they are. Otherwise, people just think you're writing nice things about the equipment that the manufacturers pay you a lot to write about. So people question their motives. Anyway, so finally now, the, one of the editors of Stereophile magazine has agreed to this guy, James Randi's claim. He's like, I can tell apart $100 speaker cables from $7,000 speaker cables, and I'm going to do it. He's offering a million dollars, the guy said, to anyone who could prove it. And so now this battle has started. How could you prove whether or not the $7,000 cables sound better than the $100 cables? And I like this because it's not science, but... If you construct the proper experiment using scientific method, you could figure it out. You could answer the question definitively once and for all. So I want you to think about uh, how you would do that experiment because you know a million dollars could be at, at stake here. All right, in reading Mean Genes, uh, you'll see on the syllabus, you should have t for today read the two chapters from the section on friends and foe, foes. How many of you have done that reading? How many of you have not done that reading? All right, all right. So a lot, a lot of you have. Uh, at the beginning of that section, we talk about the Australian social spider. I couldn't find a picture of that. This is the closest spider I could get to it. Uh, but the Australian Australian social spider is an, an interesting case because this is the story where the female lays a bunch of eggs and. As these little spiderlings, her, her sons and daughters, hatch out of the eggs, uh, right where they are, she's sitting right on top of the, the egg sac, they start munching away at her gut. They literally puncture her flesh, and they eat it, and they suck her, her juices out until she dies. It's brutal. And she just sits there and takes it. She could walk away, but she doesn't. And we joke, because my mother actually did say it, that uh, that's how child raising is. But with her, it, it took about 40 years for us to suck her dry. Uh, don't be hating, Mom. Uh, but the issue is this. Why would that happen? I see that example of a mother. She has a bunch of offspring. And then she gives to them so much that it causes her to die. I think of that as an extreme act of kindness, and it's going to be sort of an opener of what we're going to talk about for the next three lectures or so. It seems like a silly question. Maybe it seems like a silly question. It doesn't to me. Why do we see so much kindness in the world? We have talked about how genes work, how they're passed on, how the process of evolution, particularly by natural selection, Causes, causes genes that have, lead to uh, higher reproductive success to increase their frequency in the population. All of that would seem to be a very selfish process, right? A, an individual that is going to help out some other individual that carries different genes, 
whatever genes inside that person that are motivating them somehow, causing them to act kindly to help out these other genes to maybe have higher reproductive success, that seems a little bit in conflict with evolution by natural selection. It was certainly uh, a cause for uh, worry in Darwin. And the answers to this question, we actually have some very good answers, are interesting, but it took a long time before people came up with them. So what I'm going to do today and on days today, Tuesday, today and Thursday, I'm going to develop what I think of as a complete theory of kindness in that it's a theory that will make predictions about when we should see kindness, which individuals we should see kindness between, and there'll be pretty good predictions. What I'd like you to do, most of you are, are North Campus types, when I give you my complete theory of kindness, it's going to seem really cynical. And my, my guess is that you're not going to like it at first. You're going to think that somehow it takes the beauty out of life or that something about it is not, something about it is not going to sit well with you, I'm guessing. Uh, I want you to think about an alternative theory of kindness. In other words, why do we see one individual do something kind for another individual? Surely uh, you can come up with another theory of kindness. And I want to see how it does relative to, to my theory. So here's, here's my theory in brief. And it's not just me. Lots of biologists have been thinking about this for a while. We're going to see kindness. And by that, I mean anytime you see an individual doing something that comes at a cost to them but seems to benefit another individual. And we'll see this. We'll see that sometimes they're doing it because the individuals that they are helping out actually carry some of their genes. Their parents, their kids, their siblings, their cousins. Because they have relatives in common, they receive their genes from similar places, so they're likely to share some in common. We'll see how that works. The other is reciprocity, that you can do something nice for someone else because they're going to return the favor, and you can count on that. And if you can count on that, you're actually helping your own genes because you're, it's like a bank account. You're storing goodwill in these other individuals, so that can still be in your genes' best interest. So those are, those are going to be the two ways that I am going to explain it. Let me write it down in, in slightly uh, more precise terms. I would say that, and this, this I'm kind of anthropomorphizing, why are people nice to each other? I do mean people, but I also mean in the animal world. If I see a spider giving her life so that her offspring can, can have a better start on life because they're more nourished, I view that as, as being nice. That's probably nicer than any of you are ever going to be. But uh, it's still, it's in a continuum of be nice to someone else. So answer one will be this falls under the category of what I call kin selection. There can be a gene inside you, call it gene X, that causes you to act in a certain way so that you increase the reproductive success of other individuals that happen to carry gene X. So think from gene X's perspective. If gene X causes more copies of gene X to be present in the population, then that's what we're going to see. If gene X causes fewer, fewer copies of gene X to be in the population, then we're not going to see gene X. This is the thing we're going to talk about today. Who else shares the genes that I share? such that they might be causing me to be nice to those individuals. And how nice should I be towards them? How likely is it that certain relatives of mine share the same genes as me? And the other case is this, reciprocal altruism. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue oops, that all kindness is either kin selection or reciprocal altruism or a mistake. And we can even predict when, when we'll see the mistakes and why. But the second case would be you've got a gene that causes you to help other people unrelated to you, but they're going to return the favor, therefore that gene that caused you to help them out actually benefits. So gene X buffers itself from the uncertain future by storing goodwill in others. We call it reciprocal altruism. Question in the back. So does that mean like racism is natural? Does that mean that racism is natural? Ah, it's a good question. It, uh, 
We are going to discuss, before, before I even answer the, the question, we're going to discuss this idea, and not today, but look, lecture 19, we're going to discuss the idea that things that are natural, people tend to think are good or the way the world should be. And just because something is natural doesn't mean that it's good or bad. You know, smallpox is natural, uh, the cure is not, but I think the cure is better. In terms of is racism, tricky. So your argument would be people who are, are of another race are less likely to share a gene uh, with you, therefore it's going to be less likely that you would see kindness towards them. A lot of people have made that argument. The problem is the reasons we code one person as one race versus another tend to focus on a really small number of genes, uh, whereas there are lots of other genes we carry that someone of one race, let's say I'm uh, as likely to share with you as I am with someone else. So from the genetic perspective, it tends not to work very well. Lots of people think, it seems like a, a reasonable assumption, turns out from a genetic perspective that race is not a very good predictor of how closely related you are to someone. So, so the answer is no. All right, so, question. Oh, RS stands for reproductive success. So anytime you see an individual helping out someone else, in the end, it's actually selfishness. So there, there is no true altruism where you do something that's good for you, sorry, that is bad for you, good for someone else. Genes that code for that kind of behavior have lower and lower and lower market share within the population until they disappear. However, people do kind things because it helps out their relatives, so the gene that causes me to do it increases in frequency, or I benefit because in the end I get helped out. In all of these discussions, things are going to focus on the concept of fitness. And I mentioned this last time. Question? Right, okay, so the question is, you see someone who's homeless and you do something nice for them, uh, Mr. Science Guy, where does your, your total theory of kindness uh, explain that? And it does explain that, and I'm not going to, hopefully you'll know it, uh, after you've heard today's lecture, Thursday's lecture, and next Tuesday's lecture. Combining all of them, I'm sorry to withhold it, uh, the answer, but my theory explains it. Of all the things we're going to talk about in the class, these next three lectures are really amazing. They, nothing has helped me see the world uh, in a light that, that helps me understand behavior more than what we're going to talk about. And uh, it's not going to make you feel depressed, I promise. Okay, fitness is this concept. It's really tough. Biologists all talk about it, evolutionary biologists. It's very hard to define precisely but I'm gonna try a little bit. It's the relative reproductive success. In other words, I always use the metaphor of market share because the alleles for a particular gene in a population total 100%. So if one of them is increasing, another one has to be decreasing. If one decreases, it means that a, a different allele gets more market share. So it's just this relative measure of a phenotype or a genotype, you can talk about it with either, but any allele that causes an individual to have higher fitness than they would have had if they carried an alternative allele, those alleles increase in frequency. So when I talk about fitness, that's what I mean. You carry an allele, and by carrying that particular allele, you're going to have greater reproductive success than if you didn't carry it. So we looked at these guys when we first talked about uh, our study with steroids, but uh, I put this up because it's yet another word. We had evolution, we had a couple of other words that, that have one definition in the non-science world and a different one in science. Well, the word fitness, uh, we tend to think of it as some physical feature of your, your vigor, muscularity, or aerobic capacity, or something, and that's not what we mean in evolutionary biology. In evolutionary biology, physical fitness might be a component of fitness, but it's not the whole thing. So we can talk about a gene 
Actually, that's a little bit sloppy. Eh, I mean, it's correct, but what I really mean is an allele. So one version of this gene that helps itself increase numerically relative to alternative copies of the gene, so to other alleles. So the question is, how does the allele do it? I'm not going to talk about this first way. I carry an allele that causes my sperm counts to be higher than if I didn't carry the allele. That generally is going to lead to an increase in my own reproduction. That's just called direct fitness. The allele causes you to have more kids. Maybe it gives you some physical character that makes you much more desirable to the opposite sex than you would be if you didn't have it. If that's the case, we expect there to be lots of copies of it next generation relative to the alternatives. That would be a fit allele, and it would increase in, in frequency. But suppose I don't have any of these, these alleles that make you so attractive to the opposite sex. I got, I got a bum draw. I don't have many of them. But instead, I decide that I'm going to spend a lot of my time helping out my brother Kevin. Kevin's a charismatic, good-looking, interesting, smart guy. And so I think I'm going to take a second job and I'm going to send all the money to Kevin. That way he can raise more kids. I think he's limited in so, to some extent by cash, his ability to raise kids. He has one, one son, Oscar. He's the same age as my son. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say that Jack is much cooler than Oscar. Uh, <laughs> he is. Uh, <laughs> but I could get that job, send all this cash to Kevin, so that suddenly Kevin is flush with money, he can take time off from work, he can buy more food, he can buy a bigger house, he can get nannies to help him out. He can do all sorts of things so that he has more kids. Kevin and I both got our genes from the same place. We have the same mother and father. So the likelihood that he shares some of my genes is pretty high. Therefore, the kids that he produces have genes that he got from the same place I got my genes. So in a sense, he's passing on genes that I'm likely to carry. So it's an indirect way that I have still increased the reproductive success of some of the genes that I carry. So in a sense, I have helped my fitness. I mean, the alternative is I send all my money to you, right? And you have more kids. Now, is that going to help me? Certainly not as much as helping out Kevin because you and I don't have the same parents or grandparents. So together, these two are going to equal something called inclusive fitness. Oops, I did have some slides. So this is my direct fitness. I can just produce kids like this uh, who wear shorts just like dad. Uh, not, so, Nonetheless, the alternative, this indirect fitness where you help close relatives of yours also have high reproductive success, that factors into your fitness. So instead of talking about fitness, we like to talk about inclusive fitness that says, remember, there are multiple ways that I can increase my, the market share of the alleles I carry, produce my own kids, or I can produce, uh, help my, my close relatives produce kids. Anytime you see siblings, here's a lady with her four kids. Anytime you see siblings, because they got their genes from the same place, uh, they share a very high proportion of them. Therefore, you realize that they can help out their own genes just by, by uh, helping out their offspring. Here's the question, though. Not only... Not only do I have a brother, Kevin, who I could help, I've got another brother, Patrick. I could help him, too. He doesn't have that much money. He's got a lot of good features. He got his genes from the same place as me, though, so in some ways, some of uh, the genes that I have, he might have. Should I help him? I could probably help him. What about my cousin, Jeff? Every summer, we would spend a couple weeks with my cousins, and Jeff was my age, and his mother and my mother were sisters, so two of our grandparents, two of my four grandparents are the same as Jeff's. So clearly, he got some of his genes from uh, 
those two grandparents. I got some of mine from them as well. Should I help him raise kids? Would I increase my indirect fitness by helping out Jeff? Yes. The question is, how much should I help him? Should I help him as much as I help Kevin? Well, Kevin and I got all of our genes from the same two people. Jeff has these two grandparents I've never even met. And half of his genes come from those two. So clearly, he and I don't share as many genes. We still invite them over every Thanksgiving. But I feel less inclined to be nice towards Jeff. The question, I, I wrote down this, this phrase, revealed preference. This is not directly related to this, but I just said I feel less inclined to be nice towards Jeff. Have any of you taken an economics class where you learned the phrase revealed preference? This is important in biology. It's also important in economics. It's important in all behavior. You don't know revealed preference? Oh, this is good. Revealed preference is a idea that I refer to every day of my life. Revealed preference says that very frequently, if you want to understand how people behave or what their preferences are, they'll tell you. What are some things people will tell you about their preferences? Oh, I don't watch, I don't watch TV. Or, oh, I, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I like this, this uh, thing. Or I, I like this kind of food. Or I don't like that kind of food. Or, oh, I love having people over. I like going out. And they'll tell you things but it turns out very frequently, if you actually look at their behavior, they don't do that. The average person who says they don't watch TV in America, when they hook up uh, little connectors to their TV, the average person watches eight hours of TV. Who says they watch no TV? So what's going on there? They're lying, right? Well, they're lying, or maybe they're just unaware of their behavior. The point is this. If you want to know what people's true preferences are, should you ask them? No, you should look at their behavior. And the, re the reason I uh, write this down and why I think about it every day is that every day I will see people say one thing that I know is at odds with their behavior. And it reminds me, ah, you're going to get tricked if you, if you listen to what people say. It comes up so commonly that my wife, Julia, now has a, an abbreviation. She just says RP. And anytime she, she'll hear someone, uh, we had someone the other day, uh, I forget, we were, we were having lunch with him or something. He's like, oh, God, I love having parties. And Julia nudges me, and she says, RP. Why, why is she saying RP? Because he never has parties. And so in his mind, he's thinking, oh, no, I like that. That's something I prefer. And she says RP because it's like, ah, remember that if you want to understand human behavior, you have to watch human behavior. Anyway, so going back to the question of how much do we expect individuals to help out, there's a rule, something called Hamilton's Rule. This guy, W.D. Hamilton, came up with this idea where he said, let me figure out how you should dispense with these acts of apparent kindness towards your relatives. And he did it this way. He wrote the equation, B times R minus C is greater than zero. And we're going to talk about what all these terms equal. The first one, R, stands for the coefficient of relatedness. All right, I'll leave all these here. So Hamilton said, if B times R minus C is greater than zero, then we expect the kind act to evolve. B is going to be, how much benefit does this other person, the recipient of the act, gain from the action? So I'm going to do something kind to Kevin. In other words, I give him $100,000 that I've earned at this part-time job I have. That's going to help him out, 100 grand if I give it to him every year. Coefficient relatedness says, what's the probability that an allele that I carry is also carried by Kevin? Or what's the probability that an allele that I carry is also carried by my cousin Jeff? What's the probability that an allele I carry is carried by you? And so between you and me, it gets close to zero. On the other hand, as you get uh, someone who gets their genes from the same place you got yours, it gets closer and closer. And so we say R equals 1.0 between 
between you and yourself, the probability that you share an allele, I mean, it just, yeah, of course, I have all the same alleles as me. If you had an identical twin, so it had all the exact same alleles, coefficient of relatedness would be 1.0. So on that, you're completely unrelated to zero. So it ra ranges anywhere in there. We'll see the probability that Kevin and I share an allele is 0 0.5. The probability that I share an allele with one of my cousins, 0.125. I'll show you how to calculate those things, but those are just ones that you can remember. A cousin, 0.125. A half-sibling, 0.25. A sibling, 0.5. Finally, the cost is... What's my opportunity cost, right? While I am helping Kevin out, I could have used that 100 grand to have my own kids. And so I am going to lose some, and my kids uh, are going to share more genes with me than Kevin's genes are with him. So there's some cost, and there's some benefit. So think about that. Let's say you've got, you know, I, I'm using money right now, but you don't have to use money. I, let's say I'm really, really, really rich. I could, and let's say someone like Kevin is really poor, I could give him a bunch of money where that's going to be huge for him in terms of helping him to have kids. Big benefit. The cost to me, given that I've already got more money than I need, is really low. So some big number times 0.5, how closely related we are, minus this. If it's still bigger than zero, Hamilton says, when this is true, we expect the kind act to evolve. This equation, Hamilton's rule, is going to explain all sorts of behavior in the world. It looks like you're helping out some other individual because you're kind, but what you're really doing is doing some math inside, figuring out, well, there's a pretty high probability that they share my alleles. If I help them out, my alleles get reproduced next generation, and my uh, inclusive fitness is higher. You guys are all good with Hamilton's rule? You can, you can tinker with it. You can move it around. You could say add C to both sides. You could say if B times R is greater than C, same thing. Whenever that's true, though, you expect the kind act to evolve. Question way in the back. How do you explain the family? Okay, uh, I'm going to give you the same response I gave down here. Uh, after three lectures of this, you're going to know the answer. If you don't know the answer, uh, stop me on ne next Tuesday, because it's a great question. That is a hugely costly act towards someone that, in all likelihood, carries none of your alleles. So the benefit to your relative is almost zero. The cost to you is certainly high. Uh, it is maladaptive. But why do we see it so often? And there is, there is a reason. The question was, uh, why do we see adoption? That would seem to be strongly in violation of Hamilton's rule, and it is. OK, I'm going uh, to move on here so, so we don't run out of time. Here's a question, though. Can we use Hamilton's rule in nature? It's a really, really powerful rule that says these are the situations where you would expect to see one individual helping out another. And in the animal world, they can help out in a lot of ways. They could protect some other individual from a predator. They could uh, pick ectoparasites out of them. They could give them a little bit of their extra food. They, they could do all sorts of things like that. So we're going to say now, you go out into nature, you're a biology, uh, let's say you're someone like me, you go to graduate school, you learn about Hamilton's rule, you're interested in kindness and why individuals would, would behave that way towards someone else. You're like, yeah, I'm going to use Hamilton's rule, I want to test it, I want to find examples of it in, in nature. And so you look, and so you see uh, something like this, you know, you see some, what are they, cheetahs? Uh, and her cubs, and you want to know, how kind is she going to be to them? Or you look, these are these uh, Sifaka le lemurs. Uh, they don't really dance around like this. They, they are not so good on two feet, but if they keep moving, they don't fall down. Uh, but you're looking at them, and you want to figure out, has their behavior been shaped by Hamilton's rule? So like me, you show up to the first day in the field. You've got your lab coat on. You have a clipboard, a calculator, a pen. And you start looking at them, or you look at these elephants, and you want to know, OK, has Hamilton's rule shaped the behaviors that they do? What do you do? Field work is really, really hard. What are you going to do? Fruit flies. Or fruit flies, or penguins. Here you at least have a really good sample size. You could say, all right, I'm going to look at these penguins and see. Uh, do they help out individuals that are close relatives? How much do they help them out? How do I do this?
Not a rhetorical question. I want, you to, I want you to figure it out. Come on. I want sympathy that it's hard to be a biologist, but I also want you to try and imagine what are you going to do when you're there, or worse, you know, something like this, killer whales jumping, you want to study them. Uh, how are you going to do it? The answer is, I don't know. It's really, really hard. Hamilton rarely left his, his office where you know, he, he used math equations and didn't really think about actual animal behavior. But the question is, what are the costs and benefits? When I talked about Kevin and me, it was a little easier. You could, imagine, you could quantify in terms of money. You could look at, does he have more kids now? Does he not have more kids? Uh, we could sort of make predictions about how much it hurts me. We could estimate how likely we are to share alleles, but that's about as far as we could go. Hamilton's rule says the bigger R gets, in other words, the more closely related I am with some individual. So if R is a really big number, then the benefit, no matter how small it is, sort of is pretty high, and the likelihood that it's bigger than the cost is good. If R is really low, then you're multiplying this benefit to someone else by a tiny number. If I'm totally unrelated to someone, however much it helps them, when I multiply it by zero, now it's zero minus C, it's never going to be bigger than, than, than this. So Hamilton would say, no, nah, you don't expect non-relatives to act kindly to each other. And the more closely related they are, the more likely B times R minus C is going to be greater than zero. So that was the first thing Hamilton said. He said, forget about nature. Let's just think in generalities at first. The more closely related you are, the more likely we'll see kindness. And the greater the discrepancy between the benefit to the other individual and the cost to you. If it's low cost to me, we expect to see a lot of it. That's it for Hamilton's rule. It's very useful, but in nature, it's very hard. I wrote this down because I want you to uh, think about this while we're going through the next few lectures. I want you to come up with an alternative hypothesis to what's written in Mean Genes, to what Hamilton's rule says, in terms of ways of predicting when we will see kindness and altruism. An important component of the scientific method is that you offer up these hypotheses to explain things, but you need to have ways of rejecting them, and you need to have alternative hypotheses that you can be testing. All right, let me tell you about one situation where we can not quite apply Hamilton's rule, but we can sort of use it. It's a case of buildings ground squirrels. Here's a few pieces of information about ground squirrels. They live all over North America, not all over, but in a lot of places. Uh, think of them in big prairies. If they see a predator approaching, they're on this open grass field. Very frequently, you'll see one of them stand on a little mound of dirt and start screaming at the top of its lungs. Other individuals, if they hear a yell, quickly find a burrow and go underground. That makes sense. Which one of these would you do? Stand on a pile of dirt and scream? Well, guess what happens? First of all, a tenth of the attacks by predators end with a dead squirrel. Here's one yelling. So a tenth of a time, usually they're going to be these aerial predators, some sort of bird of prey. Imagine a big hawk on the distance. So one individual yells. The others duck underground where they can't get eaten. Half the time, the dead squirrel was the one that was yelling. So think in terms of natural selection, a gene or an allele that you have that says, if you see a predator, scream. You would think that that would be removed from the population at a higher rate than the allele that says, if you see a predator, keep your mouth shut. And yet, if you study buildings, ground squirrels, all the time when you see predators coming, you hear the screaming. So for me, when I see that behavior, 
I think, ah, there is a preference for this screaming in certain situations. And so I want to know why. Why would natural selection not have weeded this out of the population? It's still there. Here's one piece of information, because I want you to make some predictions. At puberty, I don't think we call it puberty, but when, when they reach the age of, that they're able to sexually reproduce, males disperse. They go to a new community. The females stay in the community they were born in. Males go to a new one. They find a female there, and then they have kids. Actually, they have baby squirrels. But So my question to you is this. Now you're back in the field. You have your lab coat on. You have your clipboard. You want to collect some data. Who is making the alarm calls? Is it just random, stupid individuals? Or could you make a prediction about some feature of the individuals that are making the alarm calls? Write it down in your notebook. I think most of the alarm calls are being made by, you can put anything. I think most of the alarm calls are being made by More detail. Okay. People have gone out and they've collected data. I love when we have data. I love data in all forms. Here's what they found. They looked at percentage of animals that were giving the alarm calls. Here's what they found. Adult females, 70% of the alarm calls. Adult males, negligible. Young females, maybe 15. It varies depending on where they look. Young males, pretty much zero. When you see data like these, it's great because you don't have to know anything about statistics to know that that is a real difference. It demands an explanation, right? It's not just random. Oh, it's random who makes the alarm calls, and they just collected some freaky data. No, you don't get data that definitive. So the question is, why would an adult female be making alarm calls when half the time that there is an uh, act of predation. It's the individual calling. So this is a really high-risk activity. Why would someone do some, something so high-risk? What would Hamilton say? Yeah, so there is a benefit to her somehow. She must be helping some copies of her alleles. The cost to her is really high. So that benefit times coefficient of relatedness somehow has to outweigh it. Well, maybe she's got a sibling there, a sister, and she's going to protect that sister. They're only related by 0.5, but it saves the sister's life. Maybe she's got another sister. She saves that sister's life, too. Each of those sisters has baby squirrels, and she saves them as well. Maybe she's got her own uh, daughters. They're there. Maybe she's got her own young sons. Uh, what about her sons uh, that are adults? No, they've moved away. Question. <laughs> it's a good question. Dave, if you're going to be... Uh, helping multiple other individuals, does it change the equation? No, you get to sum up all the, the benefit times coefficient of relatedness. All of those together, if they are greater than the cost to you, then you're going to expect to see that, that action. So why the difference here, adult females versus young females? If you're a young female, you haven't reproduced yet, so you don't have that many offspring. You do have your uh, female siblings. Why the difference between the males and the females? Males are just selfish? No, males leave. Remember, they go to another community. So the number of relatives in this new community, they have their own offspring. But do they have very many cousins? No, because brothers maybe go to different communities. Do they have their parents? No. Do they have their parents' siblings? And they're, so their aunts and uncles, do they have their parents' siblings' kids? No, they don't have any of those, whereas the females have lots of them. Question. Would you say that the young people do it more for, like, sisters? 
Uh, yeah, why do the young females do it? They have their sisters, they have their parents, they have their parents' siblings that are females that haven't left, and their parents' female siblings' kids. So they're cousins. So, th so they still have those even before they reproduce. But after you reproduce and all of your daughters are still there and they have offspring, it can lead to a lot. So we can say this. We can say Hamilton's rule helps us. I'm not saying it's the be-all, end-all. But it helps us to predict some situations when we see kindness. I put kindness in quotes because you're not supposed to anthropomorphize about animals. But I do, so sue me. Yeah, that, that is, is a slightly trickier situation where uh, someone that you're involved in a relationship with, clearly you don't share genes with them. Uh, yeah, hopefully you don't. And <laughs> in those situations, usually the, the reason you see them behaving kindly is that they have shared pro projects. So in order for me to help these offspring that I am you know, responsible for, I have someone else who they have strong genetic interests in those as well. And so they are the best person you can count on to take care of them. So it's one situation where they are also taking care because your offspring share the genes with them. So you don't have relatives above. You don't have cousins, uh, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, parents. But you have all of your offspring you're, are going to be shared. So in that way, you don't share genes, but you share genetic interests. What's that? What if you don't have any kids? Uh, so, so and, and you're a Belding's ground squirrel? Or just, and, and you're a human. Uh, you still have the possibility of having them. So there is a cost to helping out another individual. Uh, but you can still benefit your siblings. You can still benefit your parents. You can still benefit your, your cousins. It's very difficult to exactly quantify the costs and benefits in nature. It is possible, though, to calculate R, the coefficient of relatedness, which, as I told you before, is the probability that an allele you share, you carry, is also in this other individual because they inherited it from the same place you got yours. So before I give you these rules, I am going to give you a little pedigree. This is a set of individuals. We've got a, the squares are males, the circles are females. So A is a male. He's got a son, C. He's got another son, E. B is the mother of E and C. So this is like me and Kevin. We have the same parents. Uh, anytime two individuals have the same father, same mother, we call them siblings. It's tricky to use the human terms for close relatives or kin because in the animal world, they don't tend to follow as rigidly the rules that we follow. Sometimes you'll see weird things where, you know, one individual is with, you know, someone that is like, you know, an aunt or an uncle and they, 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 they do things that are, are closer to inbreeding than, than we might do. But in this, this particular situation, then you've got C, who's a male. He's got a daughter, F, that he had with this woman, D. So did E. So, <laughs> what's up, D? Uh, so D, what's going on there? Yeah, so she's had kids with two brothers. I'm sure there's a good explanation for it. It could be like that maybe C died and, and she stepped in to take care of uh, the kid. I don't know. I don't know what she's doing. Uh, she's a mess. Uh, one of her daughters, G, then gets married uh, or starts living with age. And <laughs> I, I don't know anything about this. I don't know what, who these individuals are. Uh, they have I. I could look at any individuals here and I could say, what is R, the coefficient of relatedness between C and E? In other words, C and E, we already talked about. They share a father and mother. Or I could say F and G. 
Not only do F and G have the same mother, but their fathers are, are siblings. So let's figure out how to do this. I have three rules for calculating R, and I'm going to give you those rules first, then we'll, we'll come back and do the calculation. First rule is this. Up, 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 down, down, down. Easy to remember. What it means is when you're calculating it, you're going to start with one individual, and you're going to find the pathway to the other one, always by going up first and either bumping into that individual or changing direction once and then going down. This will be easier when we do it, you'll see. Second one, all paths are created equal. So we have to find all possible ways through which two individuals are related. And once we find all these ways, we're going to multiply all the links on a path. And we're going to add up a sum from all of them. As I said, this will, this will be clear, clear when I do it. You have to do it with an example. Here we have the act of predation, almost. That's not a building's ground squirrel. Uh, it's some kind of old field mouse, I'm guessing. Uh, an owl. OK, so let's go to our pedigree here, and let's figure out how to do it. So I want to look at. What's the coefficient of relatedness? So I'm calculating R. R is just a probability statement. How likely is it that an allele in C also is in E because they had inherited from the same place? So here's what you do. You start with C, and you have to get to E. And this is where the up, 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 down, down, down. So you start at one of them, and you move up. And now there's nowhere else to go. So now you move down, and you want to get to E. So the only place you go is this way, and you hit it. Each one of these pathways is 0.5. In other words, the probability that a particular uh, allele that's in my mother, that it gets sent down to me, given Mendel's law of segregation, is 0.5. She has two copies of every allele. And when she makes her eggs, that's actually a, my father, all right, so a male. When he makes his sperm, every sperm has either one allele or the other. So the probability from his two alleles, the probability that I got one of them is 50%. So you would say 0.5 is the probability that an allele that A has also gets passed down to C times this one. Probability that an allele in A gets passed down to E. Well, A has two copies of every one, only gives one to E, so it's 0.5. Are we done? No. Because it says, all paths are created equal. Don't forget a path. Is there another way that you can go up, 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 down, down, down? Yes. We can say, up here, C has this uh, mother's B. And from B, you can go down to E. So you went up, you changed directions once, and you come down. There are two pathways. The probability of an allele being passed any time from one individual down to the next is 0 0.5. So it's 0 0.5 times. 0.5. And the last of those rules said you multiply the 0.5 within a path, so 0.5 times 0.5, or 0.5 times 0.5, and you add between them. So we add this up, and it equals 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25, uh, times 2 equals 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is the coefficient of relatedness or the probability that C and E share an allele. Let me do F to G. It's a little bit more complicated. Uh, I'm going to do it on the same drawing, so I'm going to have to use uh, dotted lines. So ignore those 
previous line, so f to g. So how do I get from f to g? I could go the obvious way and go like this. Up to d, her mother, and then down to g, her half-sister. So it's that 0.5 whoops, squared, we'll say. So 0.5 times 0.5. That's the probability that f and g share an allele by descent through their mother. However, we're not done, right? Because I can go <coughs> up to c, and then I can go up again, up. I am allowed to change directions once if I don't run into the individual. So now down to e and down to g. So I went up, then I went down, I multiply within, 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5. So plus 0.5 to the fourth. What does that equal? Half of 0.5 would be 0 0.25, 0 0.125, 0 0.0625. So that's a pretty small number, the probability that F and G share an allele that they inherited through uh, their grandfather. Are we done? No. I might also go this way. We start out going up, but as long as the pathway is at all different, it counts as a unique way that you could have inherited. Up to C, then I can go up to B. Now I can turn directions down to E and down to G. One, two, three, four, plus 0.5 to the fourth. Is there any other way I can do it? No. So that's, what's that? You always have to go up first. So 0.0625 plus 0.0625 is 0.125. This is 0.25. Point, oh, it's hard to do it in my head. 0.325. Point, what? 0.375? Come on, are you going to make me do this for real? 0.125. Sorry, you're right. I will never doubt you again. Okay, 0.375. So this is interesting. We can just kind of do a reality check here. 37% likely, or 37 and a half probability that F and G share an allele. So it's not quite as high as it would be if we were talking about full siblings. And that makes sense because they're almost full siblings. They have the same mother. If they were just uh, half-siblings, it would be 0.25, but because their fathers are also closely related, that's going to bump up our probability. So that, that makes sense. We got you know, almost all the way up to the same probability as if they had the same father. So in Hamilton's rule, we can calculate uh, coefficients of relatedness. I'm going to have you do some of this on the problem set. You're going to do some of this in discussion section. You have to just do a few of these. Uh, don't be intimidated by them, thinking, oh, I don't like math, I'm not a quantitative person. All you're doing is taking the number 0.5 and multiplying it by 0.5. And you do it a few times, and then you do a little bit of addition. right? You could do that in sixth grade. So it's useful. It's going to help us to figure out when we uh, want to know coefficients of related. Now, what if I said I and H? How are they related? That's a tricky one because the up-downs don't really work. All you do is you choose one of the individuals, and if you can start by going up, you do. And you go up, 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 bang, you hit them. You stop. That's it. That's the only way they're related. So how, what's their coefficient of relatedness? 0.5. <clears throat> so that is the one case where it's not up, 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 down, 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 because you go up, 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 and you hit them. So now we can tell how to figure out coefficients of relatedness. Just gave away the next topic, but whoops, I'll skip that. Sorry. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk about those. Oh no, and those are the last ones. Sorry. I, I won't show you the gross things. I was gonna talk about something, but I've changed my mind. Here's the question. When I was growing up and I was trying to figure out who should I dispense with these acts of kindness that I want to that come at great cost to me? Should I be nice to Jeff? Should I do something good for him? Or should I do something good for Kevin? Now, when I look at Kevin, 
Am I able to immediately see a pedigree and say up, 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 down, 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 and know that the probability that I share an allele with Kevin is 0.5? Like, how do I know that? Or worse yet, what if it's a building's ground squirrel? Are they good at math? I don't know. What about Jeff? Why is it that somehow I knew that I shouldn't be quite as nice to Jeff as I am to Kevin, but that I should be nicer to him than I am to you? Why? I mean, I, this is important because we're at this border between really elegant theoretical predictions and putting them into practice. And so Hamilton sa says, hey, you can calculate R. And we have you know, B times R minus C. If it's greater than zero, we expect the evolution of apparent altruism. So that's good. That's useful. The problem is the reason that I am nice to Kevin, he's hard to avoid for one. He calls me every day uh, in my office. No, but he's nice. He just wants to talk. But when I was little, my parents said, be nice to Kevin. He's your brother. That's how I know. That's it. Like, I never did the pedigree. I never compared our DNA. I never analyzed anything. Be nice to Kevin. He's your brother. Be pretty nice to Jeff. He's your cousin. That's what my mother said. She thought he was a bad seed. Uh, he was, is. Shh, don't tell. If I'm going to be kind to other individuals, I need to know who my kin are. And because we cannot see within the DNA of another individual, that poses a problem. Now, my parents could have lied to me, right? They could have said, be nice to Kevin, he's your brother. But maybe he's not. Maybe we don't share any alleles. How do I know that he's my brother? For starters, when he leaves messages on my machine because I screen his calls sometimes, his voice sounds exactly like mine. If I listen to it, sometimes I think, whoa, did I leave myself a message? It's really similar. Or my brother Patrick will call. He calls a lot too and leaves messages. He sounds exactly the same as Kevin, sounds exactly the same as me. Now, if someone else calls me, they don't sound like me. So maybe that's a way that I can say, eh, maybe, maybe you know, there's some truth to what my parents are saying. How else might I know that, that Kevin and I share alleles? And that sort of is getting at the question at the beginning. Ah, is there some link between racism and Hamilton's rule? Phenotype. Say it again. Phenotype. Phenotype. Uh, maybe I look like him. I don't actually look that similar to Kevin. Uh, Kevin, Kevin is maybe the luckiest guy on, on earth. Or it's, it's cruel to say that, but good things happen to Kevin all the time. He had his car double parked once at, at a bank machine. His girlfriend at the time, now his wife, was running to get some money. Someone comes out, looks at him, and they say, are you here for the commercial? He said, no. And they're like, do you want to try out to be in a commercial? And he's like, not really. They're like, come on, just come up. It'll be fun. So he's like, all right. He parks his car. He goes up. And they have him chew some gum for a while and then smile at the camera. And they give him this part in a Trident gum commercial. And I don't watch TV, which means maybe eight hours a week. Uh, I don't watch TV. I have seen this commercial, no lie, a hundred times. You know, the camera's moving around. Millions of Americans, you know, go out for breakfast, you know, and they don't bring their toothbrush, you know, and the camera's moving around. There's this yuppie-looking but very good-looking guy uh, sitting there in a suit, and, and, and that's Kevin, and it keeps moving around, you know, and then it says, you know, try it and gum, and he smiles and he flicks out the gum. That's Kevin. $75,000 $75, he made for that. He gets checks all the time. Yeah, are you here for the commercial? Uh, <laughs> he got a call after that. So on, hi, yeah, we saw your commercial. Uh, would you be interested in doing an ad for The Gap for us? Uh, he's like, yeah, all right. Uh, so, so that's Kevin. I, he doesn't need any help at all from me. All right. But let's think less about Kevin and me, or you and your siblings, and let's think about the building's ground squirrels, because they are doing something that involves recognition of kin, and they don't have the ability to peer within their DNA and make probability assessments. So biologists have given a few jargony-sounding things. Don't, don't worry about the terms so much. Uh, 
but that say there are ways that you can make assumptions about who your close relatives are. One is treat anyone in the nest as kin or you know, the, the borough or in my case, Kevin and I shared a room growing up. We shared a room at Dykstra for many years. I know, yeah, I don't, don't ask me why. So he was always there for uh, wherever I was, there's Kevin. And so that's a pretty good assumption that they're going to be kin, more likely than someone who's unrelated. Or you could say social association, anyone you remember from childhood, someone who was around a lot way back when. So the building's ground squirrels might be able to use some of these things. Or as someone said, phenotype matching. You say, all right, anyone who resembles you, and that can be, you know, that's phenotypic resemblance, can be your voice, or smells like you. Uh, lots of species there, uh, lots of kin recognition in tadpoles, for instance, that is accomplished because they smell alike. It's really cruel. You can take them out of uh, the place where all the tadpoles are, and you can rinse them off with other water, and you can put them back, and now they don't have the same scent, and they get ostracized. It's cruel. Uh, we used to hose Kevin off. At, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Sorry. I should be kinder to him today. Anyway, so you've got this as well. An individual who resembles you in some way maybe is more likely to be your close kin than someone who isn't. All of these are not particularly great. We call them rules of thumb. You should write that down. Rules of thumb are methods of drawing a conclusion that aren't precise, but they're usually accurate. So a rule of thumb is something that usually gives you the right answer, and it's easy to do. So if you treat the individuals who look like you, resemble you, as kin, then you're using this rule. And you can be built. Your genes can build you to use rules of thumb. As sort of a silly example, but I think it might be related, did you ever meet someone who has the same name as you? And immediately you somehow feel like some <laughs> affinity to them because your brain is having trouble. It's, you're getting a signal that, no, they're, they're like me somehow. Um, question. Okay, perfect question. What if there are people you think are kin and they're not? So in other words, reality is in conflict with the rules of thumb. So the rules of thumb, and I'm going to write this here and then answer your question. It's important enough to be a, a take-home message that genes can code for behavioral rules of thumb. And so your question is similar to the adoption question from earlier. From an early age, there is some individual that is unrelated. Let's say you've got an adopted sibling but all the rules of thumb tend to be telling you, giving you the signs of kinship, at least early on. You've got spatial association, social association, and all babies pretty much look the same. So uh, yeah, there, there's not, not much conflict going on there. Yeah, you get cross-firing in the brain that says, wait, no, it is my sibling. No, it's not my sibling. I'm not sure. Wait, I think it is. Uh. And so you can, though, these behavioral rules of thumb can override uh, other knowledge. So you can, you can generally, you find that people treat adopted kin pretty well. The earlier they are brought into the family, the, the, more, they're, you, the more difficult it is to distinguish behavior towards them uh, from behavior towards true kin. So you get a little bit of conflict, but the stronger the signals are from the rules of thumb, the more consistent it is with, with the uh, behavior towards kin. So is it psychological more than biological? No, that's a false dichotomy. Psych psychological is biological. Uh, wow, that was profound. Uh, yeah, I don't want to make a distinction. You, you, you know, your, your genes are coding for a bunch of different scenarios. So it's, your genes don't say, be nice to this person. Your genes say, uh, have a conditional strategy. Be nice to this individual if they satisfy uh, X, Y, or Z. They look like you, they smell like you, you remember them, they've always been around, etc. So psychology is kind of that. It's these contingent strategies. 
But I like the, the, the question that you were posing suggests an experiment. And I always want to have experiments rather than me just asserting that this is what individuals do. They follow rules of thumb. I would say, how do you know they follow rules of thumb? I say, I don't know. Let's do an experiment. So what if we do this? You're a biologist. You go in. You trap a squirrel, an old female. You drive in your truck 200 miles away to another ground squirrel community. You let her out. You then keep an eye on her. You mark her somehow so that you can tell what she looks like. So now she is in a neighborhood where the number of relatives she has is zero. My question to you is this. Now an aerial predator approaches. Is she going to make the alarm call or is she not? Write down in your notebook, yes or no. Yes, she's going to make an alarm call. No, she's not. What I've done is set up exactly the situation that your question in the front brought up. You've got something where the truth is R equals zero with everyone. The rules of thumb say, I'm an old female. What do old females have? <laughs> Lots of relatives. So I want to look at your answers. Where's your answer? Come on, write it down. All right, what is it? Tell me. You're going to say no. <laughs> you guys all seem to be really strong believers in our power to just override our genes. Which, as a rule, I tend to be a big believer in that as well, right? The subtitle of Mean Genes is Taming Our Primal Instincts, which means you override them. In the case of this, they make the alarm calls. So whatever gene she's carrying says, the rule of thumb outweighs truth. I, if, I, if you're an old female, the odds are you have a lot of relatives. This has been done repeatedly. You always get the same result. Isn't that great when you get an experiment like this? So that is a definitive demonstration of this idea of the rules of thumb. Question. Could it be like making, uh, well, I better make it right here because um, I better like. I better, I want them to like me. Uh, that's a good, it's a good question. So what you should do is think about, okay, what are, is there an experiment that you could come up with then that would distinguish that as well? Uh, and there are. There are ways of testing it. But I'm going to stop right here for the day. I will see you on Thursday.